Last, last week, Dr. Stowe made a couple statements. Uh, that I'll, Go to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers 13. Numbers 13, and, you know, I haven't ministered on two Sundays, so you might get all kinds of messages coming out today, so. Let's see what message comes out by the Holy Spirit this morning. A couple of things he said last week, he, he said about, one, we have to not let truth slip. Don't let the truths that we've heard slip. Another thing he said is the adversary doesn't want you, want you to experience God's best. He talked about being established on the word of God. He talked about uh, Psalms 37, commit, delight, trust in, and rest in, right? Yes. The word. Why? We, 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 we can't let the word slip. Why? Because the adversary wants to steal the word because, because if he takes away the word, then he takes away the foundation of your faith. We can't let these truths slip because, because God's best for you is found in his word. And what I want, what's on my heart this morning, <clears throat> you can see it really in Hebrews 5. You don't need to turn there. In Hebrews 5, it says, you all ought to be teachers by now. Meaning you've heard the word long enough that you ought to be teachers by now. He said, but you are unskillful. You're unskillful in what? It says you're unskillful in the word of righteousness. Meaning you should, be, you should be a teacher by now. You should be farther along than you are right now. And he said, but you're letting this truth slip. You ought to be teachers by now. You should be teaching other people by now, but you're unskillful in the word of righteousness. And we'll, we'll see how, how many messages that comes out of this, but just talk out of my heart. There's things I've been meditating on and for all that were here yesterday for our, our Thrive meeting with those that serve and, and volunteer here, I, I dealt with sin consciousness. And we're gonna touch on that here in a moment because I believe sin consciousness is what's hindering you from breaking through in your life. I believe sin consciousness is what's hindering you from stepping up and stepping into all that God has for you. Sin consciousness. Amen. And we're gonna, we're gonna unpack that here in, in just a minute uh, because this is vital. These, these are truths that are foundational truths that most believers don't have a revelation of, but yet they should be foundational to the church. They should be foundational to the believer. In Numbers chapter 13, we see some principles here that's letting it, giving some insight in the children of Israel have already been out of bondage, told to go into the promised land, we know, according to Scripture, that it was an 11-day journey, but it took them 40 years. There's some things that you have battled that you should have won by now, but it's been a 20-year journey. You have a call upon your life that you should have stepped into many years ago, but you have yet to step into it because of how you see yourself. Most people don't understand from the standpoint of, the, of who they are in Christ Jesus. They don't understand their identity that is found in Christ. And most of the time when you think of sin, or we talk about sin consciousness, and, and this is the way I looked at it, is sin consciousness had to do with, with me and God and how I saw myself with God, but I never realized how it affected my everyday life between me and you. But this understanding of sin consciousness affects every area of my life. Sin consciousness affects my ability to relate to my spouse. 
Sin consciousness affects my ability to lead. It affects my ability to, to minister. It affects my ability to pray with boldness. It affects my ability to submit, to surrender to, to other things and people around me. It, 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 it affects every area of my life. You, it, it's hard for you to walk in love if you are in, inundated and consumed with sin consciousness. Because you're always interning, internal on, on what you're not, what you don't have, what you can't do, how, the mistakes you've made, uh, how you'll never measure up. And all those things are really, are really affect how you relate to each other. And this is what I ministered to, to all those that serve here, that in order for us to go higher into another level, we need to get sin consciousness out of the way and recognize who we are in Christ and our identity in the word of God. I told this story, you know, yesterday, and uh, wasn't actually planning to go into this, but told this story yesterday, and this was years ago when I when I first started um, pastoring the church, and and um, and first I, you know, what does sin conscience look like on an everyday basis? You get a call from your boss, mine being Dr. Jerry Savell, or you get a message from his secretary that says. Dr. Savell would like to meet you in his office at 8.30 a.m., be there early. But I get that message at nine o'clock at night. So I'm laying in bed. What did I do? What did I do wrong? Did, and, I, and, I, and I know that because, because I had people, I would do the same thing. And, I, and I've learned, I've got to give people a, a, a preface. This is what we're going to talk about because they tell me I didn't sleep. All I had to do was it was a simple conversation. It was nothing wrong. I actually wanted to bless them with something. But all night, they stayed up all night because what did I do wrong? I'm getting called into the principal's office. And what happened and what took place? Why, why did immediately when I get a message about Dr. Savell wanting to meet with me, why did it immediately go into negative? That's sin consciousness. Your spouse says something to you and, and somehow the tone didn't come across the way you thought it should come, but immediately, like, what did I do wrong? What, what, why, why did she say it that way? What? I mean, why? Why, why is she upset? But she's not upset. She's just talking. I, I, I remember when I first was married to Annette and it was, a Christ, it, was, it was Christmas and a lot of people were at the house. And, you know, if you, if you know my family, my, my parents, my dad doesn't talk much. Love you, dad. I know he's watching. He, he's very quiet. Mom's very quiet. And so everything's, you know, kind of like down here. My first, my, my first Christmas with Annette's family, it was loud. And I pulled her aside. I'm like, why are they? And they're talking in Spanish. And I can pick up a few words, but, but I'm like, why are they mad at each other? We're not mad at each other. We're just talking. But here, my mind is need like, did I, did I do something? What, what happened? What happened? What's going on? And, and so, <laughs> Dolores, you know. <laughs> but, it, but, the, but the thing is, is, is in, in the natural, we, we have this immediately to go to negative. Where, what's the root of that? The root of that is sin consciousness. And it, it affects every area of our life and it keeps us from being free. It keeps from being free to be you. Now, I'm not talking about we have righteousness so you can live any way you want to live and live in sin. That's not the point. The point is, the thing is that you have to, we have to be founded in righteousness and we have to be founded in our identity and who we are in God because, because I'm telling you, the power that will flow through the church when we understand who we are, the power that will flow through your life when you are out in the streets and when you're at workplace will be something that's unprecedented when you recognize who you are and what's on the inside of you. But you don't step into it because of, what if they don't receive me? Who cares? You're the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. It affects every area of our life. And we see how this identity issue affected the children of Israel going into the promised land. You have a promised land to walk into whether you realize it or not. And I'm not talking about the promised land of heaven. We already had that through the blood of Jesus. Amen. But I'm saying there's things that God has promised. There's things that he's established in your life for your purpose yes. that he wants you to walk in, but we have to, you have to step into your true identity. 
So let's pick this up here in Numbers chapter 13. And I'm not gonna take the time to go through the whole chapter, just pulling out a few things. But in Numbers 13, verse one says, and the Lord spoke to Moses. Who spoke to Moses? The Lord. He goes, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving, I am giving, I am giving. Who's giving it? God, the Lord. The Lord is giving to the children of Israel. So God is giving them the land. I just want you to go look at it. One thing we have to make sure, uh, something we have to make sure of is we don't add to what God says. Now, if you go later in this chapter, because then it goes in and tells about all the different leaders from each tribe and who they're sending. But verse 17 says, Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like. Did God ever tell him to say that? No. God never told, told Moses to go see what the land's like. He just said, go look at the land that I'm giving to you. He says, and, and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they, uh, they uh, inhabit are like camps or they're like strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are forests or there are not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land. God never said, go and tell the spies what to look for. He said, just go look at the land. Just go look at the land. God didn't need them to come back with a report of what they thought the land was like. And you and I need to stop trying to figure out how God is gonna do what God's gonna do in our lives. It's not that you figure where you, whether you can be in ministry or not. It's not up to you to figure if you're good enough or not. It's not up to you whether you're strong enough or not. The question is, what did God tell you to do? Because yes. who's giving the land? God is going to give the land. So we know, that, we know the story. They come back and verse 30 says, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and so, let, let, uh, actually, hold on. Verse 27, it says, Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said... Let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. Amen. We're well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And, and it says, and we are like grasshoppers in our own sight. We're like grasshoppers in our own sight. In our own sight. And so we were in their sight. How did they know what the people thought about them? They didn't have a conversation with anyone there. How did they know? How did they know what the other people thought of them? If you go back and you research and you go through the numbers, actually, they were scared of them because they heard about the parting of the Red Sea. They heard about what God did in the wilderness. They heard about the fire. They heard about the cloud. They heard about the miracles that took place. So they were actually afraid of them. But the question is, is we were grasshoppers in our own sight and so we were in them. You have to stop consulting the enemy. You have to stop thinking about what you think other people are thinking about you. You have to stop thinking about what other people are thinking about you because bottom line, people think about themselves and they don't think about you.
You're, we're really not that important, okay? <laughs> but the bottom line is, is, is the thing is, is you have to go back. What did God say? God says, I'm giving you this land, but only two people of all the, all the, all the spies came back and said, hey, shut up. Come on. It's probably not nice, sorry. <laughs> It said he quieted the people and just cut them off. And he goes, why are we talking about? That was not the information. The information is, hey, God's with us. God's with me. God's with you. God's with us. We are well able to overcome it. We are well able to take it. But the question was, is they saw themselves as grasshoppers. And the the issue, because in the natural, they were smaller than the giants. The question wasn't about how they saw themselves or how they saw the, 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 the giants, the biggest issue was is they didn't see God bigger than the giants. Because in the natural, yeah, in the natural, the circumstance you're going through might look impossible. That could be your giant. But the question is, the issue had nothing to do about themselves or the giant. The question was they couldn't see God bigger than anything else. And what you and I need to do is get a true identity of who we are in God and what's on the inside of us. Who's on the inside of you? And realize that you're a child of the king. And realize that you were created and made in his image. Adam and Eve in the very beginning. It said they were made in the likeness of God. But yet Satan came and tried to deceive them out of what they already were. And, and, and Eve is like, you know, he, Satan's like this to Eve. He goes, if you just, you know, I just, you know, I believe this was a long process. I don't believe it was a, a one night thing. I, I think, you know, Satan's like juggling the fruit. See, God says we couldn't even touch it. God never said they couldn't touch it. God just said, don't eat it. The biggest issue, really, I believe in the garden was worship. They could have been hanging out at the tree of life all day long. But they choose to worship something else. And, when you, and what you hang out with is what you're worshiping. Amen. Worship isn't about the music at church, okay? Worship about what you give yourself to day in and day out. And so, and so by, by hanging out at this tree that they were never supposed to eat from, Satan comes and says, God doesn't want you to eat it because he doesn't want you to be like him. But the question was, they were already like him. Because they didn't really understand true identity. What was the true identity of Adam and Eve in the garden? Well, we know they were, they were naked, but the issue, it says they were clothed with the glory of God. If you look in, if you look in the book of Psalms, it tells us what that glory was. It says they were clothed with righteousness and clothed with honor. So when they, they, you know, they, they hid themselves, they hid themselves and said, because we were naked and afraid. What does God say to them? Who told you you were naked? Who told you you were naked? Let me ask you a question. Who told you that you are not the righteous of God? Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. God wants us to know the thoughts that he has about us. Go to Isaiah 55. There's some people, you know, growing up in a, even not knowing the word, but still going to church as a, you know, with my parents, but not knowing the word, there was still some things that you pick up in a religious environment. And even as a young person, I can remember hearing statements from 
people that say this don't have a full understanding of the word. And they'll say, no one's righteous, no, not one. And they'll say, you know, our righteousness is as filthy rags. People have heard that. And you're like, well, it's in the word, Pastor. Yeah, it is in the word. But the issue is we're not talking about our personal righteousness. We're talking about his righteousness. Look, Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. Look at verse 6. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. So what is it telling us here? That the wicked, let the wicked forsake his way. That means if, if the wicked need to seek a new way, right? If you're forsaking something, meaning you're, you're leaving that behind to go in a new direction. You're leaving that behind to go into a new path. So he says, let the wicked seek a new way. And the unrighteous forsake, let the unrighteous man his thoughts. So, so he wants the wicked man to seek a new path and he wants the unrighteous person to seek new thoughts. See, we need to seek new paths and we need to seek new thoughts. So the issue that was happening with the children of Israel was they were being dominated by their thoughts of what they saw, what they felt, what they heard and not being founded upon the word of God, not being founded upon the fact that God said, I will give you this land. So let the wicked forsake his thoughts and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. Are you grateful for mercy? He will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Let me ask you a question. Are you born again? That means we and you and I have been abundantly pardoned. Because then the next verse says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. This scripture has nothing to do with the fact that we can't know God's thoughts. It has, it, we can receive his thoughts when I forsake my way and my thoughts. As a wicked man and an unrighteous person, if I leave beside my way and my thoughts, then I can come up and I can see things from a different perspective. It's time for each one of us to see things from a different perspective. It's time for you to see your children, your family, your calling, your ministry, and your church with a different, in, a, in, a, in a different way and see things from a different position. You don't need to turn there, but Mark 7, verse 13, Jesus is talking to religious-minded people. And he tells them, he goes, he says this, he goes, your traditions, your traditions make the word of God of no effect. And you were like, hey, well, I go to a non-denominational church. I don't have traditions, Vic. If we look at traditions from that perspective, you could be right. But if you really, what Jesus was saying to them, he was saying to them, your customs. You know what else is a tradition? Habits. See, a tradition isn't like how you, how you do Christmas every year. Or what you do with your family every summer. Yeah, that could, that, that, that's a tradition in the way we see tradition. But what Jesus is referring to is he is saying your traditions, your habits, your customs. Get this one, your ways of life. Get this one, your attitude. Now get this one, your way of thinking. So when Jesus was saying, your traditions make the word of God no effect, he's saying, your way of thinking has more power than my word. Your thinking has more power than my word. 
It's interesting to me how many people in our world today will exalt their opinions that aren't founded on the Word of God above the Word of God. It's interesting to me that people will even exalt their education that they have that they have heard and received that is not even founded on, on truth or true science. And they will exalt it above the word of God. Traditions, customs, ways of thinking, the ways of doing things, habits, attitudes. What are attitudes? An attitude is a mental state of how you look at something. It's your mental state of how you look at a situation, how you look at yourself, how you look at others. And Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, he is saying, how you think is making my word of no effect. I can sit here and deposit the word of truth to you and the word of God to you week after week after week after week and week after week, you don't change. Week after week, we don't change. Week after week, we don't change. Week after week, we don't change. Why? Because most of the time when we come to church, we give mental assent to the word and not allow what we're hearing to go and deposit in our hearts and change our thinking. The word is designed to change our thinking, not to confirm your opinions. The word of God was never designed to confirm your thought process about how you see society. The word of God was to, we conform to it so it changes us, so we change society. Hallelujah. The word. word. But yet, my traditions can be more powerful than his word. Mm. You know, I thought God is sovereign. Yeah, but he's limited by our faith. Well, God's just going to do what God's going to do. I don't like that philosophy. (laughs) You have everything to do with you fulfilling your assignment in life. And this is something that I've heard from Keith Moore. I think one of the biggest mis- injustices and revelations that came into the body of Christ through religion is the phrase that, well, God is in control. Now, God wasn't in control when I would drive drunk. God wasn't in control when I would steal from people. God wasn't in control when I was smoking weed. God wasn't in control when I was treating, uh, treating women bad. God wasn't in control. So don't tell me, well, God is in control. The thing is, is that's just a cop-out for not taking responsibility for your actions. Oh, well, God made me this way. No, you conformed your mind to that way. And the enemy deceived you into thinking, well, that's who you are. Who told you you were naked? Where did that come from? Did that come from God or did that come from some book you read? Who told you? And it's happened so much in our society today that people don't know if they're coming or going. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's a good word. Hallelujah. Our traditions make the word of God of no effect. So if you think that you are no good, if you think that you are not righteous and you're convinced that God isn't greater than if you're convinced that you're always going to be a failure, let me let me give you a hint. You will be.
And if anything, with the sovereignty of God, hopefully you don't reap what you sow. Hopefully we have crop failures. I'm grateful for crop failures because I've sowed a lot of things that I didn't need to sow. Go to 2 Corinthians 4. Sometimes we just need the word to just wash over us. And I believe that's what's happening this morning, just the word. Yeah, there's time to be in his presence and and laying hands on people. And there's time for, for the ministry of the anointing and for the glory of God to show up and just move through the house. But there's also a time when the word needs to come forth and, and cut and, and heal. You know, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. A cut going in one way, but on the way out, it's healing. <laughs> I'm going higher. How about you? 2024, it's progressing, advancing, experiencing promotion, and seeing our highest expectation fulfilled. Whether you realize it or not, what, what's being deposited in us, and I say us because I'm not just, I'm ministering to myself, okay, Amen. is this is going to bring progression to us. Yes. Amen? Amen? The Word. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's look at verse three. It says, but even if our gospel, even if our gospel is veiled, it is to veil to those who are perishing. So the good news, but even if the good news is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So it talks about what the God of this world does. And it says that he blinds the minds of them that don't believe. So that, why is he blinding? Why does the enemy want to blind your eyes? Blind our eyes, blind the world's eyes. Because he doesn't want see, people to see the light of the gospel that would shine unto them in the face of Jesus. Amen. Meaning if, if the world can discredit Jesus, if the world can discredit the word, if the world can convince you, even as, a, as someone that's sitting in church week after week and convince you that, that, uh, that God doesn't have a plan, he, what is he? He's blinding your mind so you can't see the gospel. Romans chapter one tells us what Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Romans chapter one, I think it's 16 and 17. Go ahead and put that on the screen, Kay. Thank you, Kay. Give Kay a hand. <laughs> Man, I, I used to do that, the, the words and ran sound. It's, you need grace for it, Amen. Because, you know, if something messes up, they'd look at you, right? It's, I feel you. I feel you, Kay. I've been there. I've been there. For I am not, let's read it together. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. See, most of the time when we, we hear this scripture that's kind of what we hear. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God unto salvation. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Yes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news. See, the enemy wants to blind our eyes from the good news so we can't see the gospel. Yes. The children of Israel going into the promised land, they couldn't see the fact that God wanted to give them the land. They were trying to figure out how they were gonna do it. Yes. Well, we're just like grasshoppers. But the good news was God was going to give them the land. Yes. Let's look at the next verse. Because most of the time we don't read the next verse. It says, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. 
Why does he want to blind? Why does Satan, the God that's will want to blind our mind to the gospel? Because the bottom line is that point right there. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. It wasn't just, the gospel wasn't preached just so you could experience salvation to where you go to heaven one day. The bottom line in the fruit of the gospel is the fact that the gospel is what made me like him. The gospel is what made me righteous. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. That's why Satan doesn't want your eyes to be open to the true salvation and the full salvation that we've received. It's not just the fact that I have salvation, I'm going to heaven one day. No, now that I have, I have to have this understanding in this identity that now I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. That is my true identity. I'm not ashamed of the power of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. And you know what that power did, Vic? That power reached in on the inside of me and made me a new creation, something that never existed before. You get to get a picture of this, that when, when the disciples believed on Jesus in John 20, And it said, and the disciples believed on him. And Jesus, it said, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. See, religion, well, oh, they they received the Holy Ghost then. No, that's when they were born again. And that was the very same thing. I love this. That was the very same thing that when God created Adam and Eve out of the dust of the ground and stood them up and God breathed into their nostrils and Adam and Eve became, or Adam became a speaking spirit. God became just like God, filled with all that God was filled with. So when they believed on Jesus and he breathed on the disciples, that was the same thing that happened. They were now a new creation in Christ Jesus. And then Jesus tells them, hey, go to Jerusalem and go there, don't go anywhere else, go there until you're endued with and empowered with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Glory. That's the gospel, the fact that they were now made and now clothed with righteousness. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go to Romans 5. Okay, can you put up 1 Peter 3.18 in the Amplified Classic, please? The Holy Spirit's our teacher, amen? Amen. You're receiving something today. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. 1 Peter 3.18 in the Amplified, it says... For Christ the Messiah himself died for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, the just for the unjust, the innocent for the guilty, that he might bring us to God. Wow. There was an exchange that took place. The gospel is about an exchange My unrighteousness for his righteousness. I want you to know, church family, if you made Jesus the Lord of your life, the day you did that, that's as righteous as you'll ever be. There's not one thing that you you can do to become more righteous. Going to church doesn't make you righteous, just righteous people go to church. Giving doesn't make you righteous, just righteous people give. There's not a way to get more right. You can, you can come to church seven days a week and you're not gonna get more righteous because you became righteous when the great exchange happened. And that was the, the righteous for the unrighteous. 
But most of the time after we get saved, the enemy still beats us down. You're no good. You're worthless. You're not going anywhere. You'll never go into ministry. You keep going back to addictions. You, you, keep, you keep allowing anger to control you. You keep offense and you, 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 you can't let it go. And, and you, you, you suffer disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. And all that stems from a sin consciousness. We are more acquainted with our weaknesses than with God's strengths. What, do, what does sin consciousness look like? E.W. Kenyon says this, that, that sin consciousness is the reason for every spiritual failure. Sin consciousness is when you identify more with sin than you do with your identity of righteousness. It's in your mind you associate yourself more with your failure than God's victory. Sin consciousness is in, in your mind you associate yourself more with your weakness than God's strength. And sin consciousness can be seen throughout our lives. Sin consciousness, listen to this, destroys the passion for God in your heart. Sin consciousness will take away your vision and purpose for life. Sin consciousness is what gives you an inferiority complex. Sin consciousness will bring you to a sense of unworthiness that destroys your faith. Sin consciousness will rob you of peace of mind. Sin consciousness will keep you up at night or keep you in bed in the morning. Sin consciousness will cause you and make your prayers ineffective. When you don't see yourself from this position of righteousness, you always see your position of not being enough. Let's look at Romans 5. Romans 5. Thank you, Lord. Verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin, sin entered the world, and death through sin. And, thus de and because of that, death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness and the transgression of Adam. Meaning, even though we may have not sinned like Adam, the thing is, is we were still born into a sin nature. And it says, who is a type of him who was to come? But the free gift is not the offense. For if by one man's offenses many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man Jesus abounded to many. So just because of one, one man's offenses, death reigned over everyone. But in the same way, just because of the man Jesus Christ, this grace of one man abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. Now listen to this. For if by the offense of one man's, for by the one man's offenses, death reigned through the one. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. Therefore, because of that, as through one man's offenses, just judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. We are all subject to that. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came. Say, I'm thankful for the free gift. I am thankful for the free gift. Man's righteous act, this one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Now listen to this. For as by one man's disobedience, through Adam's disobedience, many were made sinners. Let me say there was nothing you had to do. There's nothing you did to become a sinner. You were made that way. Yeah, you were made that way. So when the world says, well, I was just made that way, well, according to this, you were. Not because God made you that way. Because sin nature made you that way. One man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also, get this, by one 
man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Made. Made righteous. It, you know what? It didn't say become righteous. If it was becoming, meaning there's a process. But when you're made righteous, it's what you are. Because of what one man did, I was made righteous. I'm not becoming righteous. I was made righteous. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that, that old things have passed away and all things have become new. And we've been, made, we've been made a new creation on the inside. It goes on to say, and we are ambassadors. And it says, through one man. It said, it's through one man. One man. It talks about that, that one man became unrighteous. One man became unrighteous so that we, that many, would be made righteous. So my identity is no longer a sin consciousness. Amen. My identity, I'm righteous. Amen. I'm righteous. I'm righteous. Let me close with this. Isaiah 54. You are, I am, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. You're not a failure. You're righteous. Amen. Well, you don't know what I did. Why do we want to exalt what we have done in our past greater than what Jesus did at the cross? Amen. Anytime you say, but you don't know what I've done, Pastor, it doesn't matter. I know what he did at the cross. Through one man's offense, many, yes, many experienced death, but through one man's obedience, many were made righteous. Amen. Isaiah 54, let me get there. You're receiving something today. Yes. Three of you are, praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Isaiah 54, where do we start, Lord? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Man, I love the gospel. I just, just where, where, I need, where I'm supposed to start here. This wasn't in my notes, so. Mm. Verse 9, for this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. Now get this, but my kindness shall not depart from you. God's not mad at you. But my kindness shall not depart from you nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. Verse 11, O oh, you afflicted ones, tossed with tempest and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems, and I lay your foundations with sapphires, and I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystals, and all your walls of precious stones. Now he's saying this to those that are afflicted and not comforted. I believe he's saying this to us this morning. Verse 13 says, all your children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness, you shall be established. In righteousness, you shall be established. God wants us established in righteousness, if you're experiencing affliction and you're experiencing this discomfort and you're experienced with this wrong identity of your past, God wants you to know this morning, he wants you to be established in righteousness. You're his child. And he says, and your children shall be taught by the Lord and great shall be the peace of your children. You have peace today because you're his child. Why do you have peace today? Because you're his child. Because you shall be established in righteousness. 
You see, when you know who you are, peace will surround you. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. It doesn't matter what you're currently going through. Hey, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And that revelation gives you a peace that the enemy cannot steal. In righteousness, you shall be established. Get this. And you shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear. You shall not fear. You see, when you're established in righteousness, fear no, will no longer be your master. Amen. When you're established in righteousness, fear will no longer be your master. Why? Because you know your identity. What was the master of the children of Israel? Fear on how they saw themselves. We're like grasshoppers in our own sight. But when you're established in your identity, and you're established in your identity, you'll be far from oppression. You shall not fear, and this is, and from terror. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror for it shall not come near you. But verse 15 says, Indeed, they shall surely assemble. Meaning there, there's things that are going to cause fear. You're going to experience attacks. People are going to come against you. He, he says, he goes, Indeed, they shall surely assemble. Meaning there's things that are going to come at you that's going to try to bring terror. There's going to be things that are going to try to bring fear. Symptoms are going to rise in your body, circumstances in your finances. But he says, indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Meaning God is not the, the responsible for this. That really kind of goes, well, God just put this sickness on me to teach me something. No. And it says, whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, this is the person that knows and they're established in righteousness. Yeah, the enemy is going to try to assemble, but the enemy is going to fall for your sake. Hallelujah. God didn't cause it. God didn't make it happen. But because of righteousness, you're going to make it through it. Because of righteousness, you're going to overcome it. Because of righteousness, you're going to win. Because of righteousness, you're going to overcome. Because of righteousness and who you are in God. Hallelujah. 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 Sin consciousness will no longer control my future. Why? Because I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Woo. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Stand to your feet. Let's give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah that we would be established in righteousness. Hallelujah. 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 And the amazing thing is, it's not your righteousness. It's his righteousness. It's his righteousness. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. This day forward, you are no longer a failure. Amen. From this day forward, you're no, no longer caught up in what you've been in bondage to. But our choice, our choice mm -hmm. is to make a decision and saying, Lord, I choose to walk in your righteousness. Just like you make a decision to walk in sin consciousness, you have to make a decision. God, I'm walking in your righteousness. And even when I, I'm doing what I don't wanna do, I'm gonna declare I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. Well, I don't feel righteous. Well, it's a good thing it's not your righteousness. 
heard Keith Moore tell the story about someone that was, um, I think it started, the story started out uh, talking about, it was a man that wanted to quit smoking cigarettes. And he actually just recently told this story at his, his faith week, and he told a story about a man that was hooked on heroin that took the same principle that he told that guy. And the guy kind of felt foolish at first, and he told the guy, he goes, every time you light up a cigarette, just say, I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. And the man said, what? Isn't that sacrilegious? Isn't that, that's, something's got to be wrong with this picture. And so every time he, he lit up a cigarette, I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. Open another pack, you know, you got to pack it down, you know, and take one out. I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. Somebody could help me with the story, but I didn't think it was about three weeks. It was something about three weeks or something like that. All of a sudden, the guy went to light up another cigarette, and I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I, I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. I'm, a, I, I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. And he threw the cigarettes and hadn't smoked in years. But just, just a month ago, it was about a month ago, he told this story. A gentleman from Florida came up to him that heard that story and he did it with heroin. Every time he shot up heroin, shooting up, he'd say, I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. And he showed up to his meeting and gave this testimony that I took the word and I declared who I am. I declared who I am. I declared who God called me to be. And he is free of heroin. But the, the key is, the, the, in, in, the, in the bottom line of everything is, you and I have to stop seeing ourselves as the grasshopper. Yes. Yes. That's the sin consciousness on what we're not, what we don't have, what we'll never be. I'll never measure up to this person, never measure up to that person. But when you see yourself in the light of the gospel, the righteousness changes everything. And your day is a weakness. The church's days of weakness will be over. You see, he's coming back for a glorious church without spot or without wrinkle. And that means it's a church that, that I believe without spot or wrinkle is we, we've got our robe of spiritually, we've got our robe of righteousness on. We know who we are. We know our identity. I'm telling you, there was nothing to stop a church or a believer who knows who they are in him. Yes. Your days of weakness and failure are over. Yes. See yourself in that true identity as I'm righteous. Yes. Hallelujah. Just lift your hands to heaven. Preaching this morning, I, I, I think some of us, if I were to do an altar call of who needs a greater understanding and who desires to walk in this true identity, if I'm honest, I believe a lot of us wouldn't raise our hand because of pride. You need to kick pride to the curb. Amen. Amen. Because honestly, every single one of us in this room, no matter how long you've been born again, deal with an element of sin consciousness. Honestly, I, I could preach a message and get a thousand people say, that was great, and one person, and what have you. It could make me feel down. Why? Because that's sin consciousness. Compare, when you compare yourselves with other people, that's sin consciousness. When, you're, when you have judgment towards other people, that's sin consciousness. How you relate to that's sin consciousness. And it affects every single one of us at different levels. So all of us, all of us need to grow in this identity in who we are.
There's, I just sense there's people here that you haven't stepped into obedience because you were hurt. And you're not doing ministry like you had been because people's words hurt you. And really it was the enemy. It was the enemy trying to keep you in really sin consciousness. So there's some husbands and wives here that you may have been being holding each other captive because of past things. Wrong words. And there's no freedom there because there's sin consciousness. It's keeping you both from stepping into your true identity and righteousness. It's time to let freedom reign. It's time to let freedom reign in your life. I just sense there's people here that you've been a disappointment. And no one knows some of the things you've done. But in your mind, in personal mind, in the quietness of your heart, you're overwhelmed by disappointment, even though that people don't even know the things you've done. But the enemy wants to keep you there, but God wants to take you higher. When you receive his word and you accept your identity, know he's pleased with you. So let his presence wash over each one of us this morning. Hallelujah. You're forgiven. You're a new creation. and he's removed all your sins. worship him for a moment. Father, we're amazed by the love you have for us. I thank you for just healing in hearts. Lord, just a shift in perspective. And I thank you as a body of believers that we can say just like Joshua and Caleb, we are well able because of you, we're well able. Because of who you created us to be, we're well able. And we declare that the enemy 
the enemy will not have victory over us any longer because today we found out who we are. We are the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. Give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you for your word.